Uh, so let me just begin by saying I bring you greetings from Fresno, California. Uh, my folks at Campus Bible Church, some of them are here at the forum this year. And uh, so uh, I'm just so blessed to have a pastoral staff that covers for me when I'm able to come to places like this. And I'm also the president of Jaron Ministries International. And uh, I think to date we have about 50 missionaries. You know, I can't keep track. I wish I was that kind of leader that I just know all the details. But, you know, I just don't. I'm, I'm grateful that I have people that work with me that do. But we're just blessed to serve you here. This is my fourth year, I believe. It's four here at the European Leadership Forum. And just got back from Romania a couple of weeks ago. Head off to Germany uh, here in uh, about a month and so forth. So I've been traveling all over the world. I've been 25 countries, but I'm just new to Europe. And you would think, well, wait a minute. Why, as an Italian, would I be just new to Europe? Uh, my calling was really to Asia. Uh, you know, I have an office in the Philippines. I've been in the Philippines for 25, 26 times. I don't know why, but God just put it on my heart, and I started going and started working with the forum and so forth. I am just so excited. I'm so excited about what God is doing uh, here in Europe. I really am. And I say that because I'm also concerned. I'm also concerned. Because the very same things that I've seen around the world, I'm seeing here in Europe. Uh, and it's a real challenge. Uh, some of you know that uh, my cousin was the infamous gangster Al Capone, my second cousin. But God reached into the Capone family and pulled me out, made me a part of your family. That's what's amazing. And yet the very same things that I saw in my family, that we were never involved in the mafia, and I don't know much about it, I don't care. But what I saw in terms of my family I also saw when I became a child of God in 1971 and the abuses in the church. The abuse of sex, the abuse of money, and the abuse of power. And it surprised me. Uh, but God reached into the flock of man and, yeah, the Capone family, and he pulled me out and made me part of your family. So I really have more in common with you guys than I do the Capones. So I don't want to talk about the Capones. It's not just of no interest. I want to talk to the family of God about the family of God because Randy Elkhorn is right when he said the evangelical landscape is littered with the carcasses of lives and ministries that have been decimated by sexual sin. It's so true. Uh, and, you know, I realize that an unholy world will never be won to Christ by an unholy church. We can have all the methodologies for planting churches, all the methodologies. We can parse Greek verbs and decline Hebrew nouns till the cows come home. We can teach homiletics. We can learn apologetics. But what, what about holyology? The study of the holiness of God and how it applies to us. Because the longest journey in the world is 18 inches from our head to our heart. I know that. I've been pastoring for 40 years. And I'm not impressed with us. I thank God for my fellow warriors, but I'm not impressed with us. I'm impressed with men and women of God who are committed to walk in holiness. Because I truly believe that that's the force from which we can reach an unholy world. Does anybody agree with that today? Anybody? So it's not just about learning methodologies for walking in holiness. It is about a study of the holiness of God and how it applies. Because the longest journey in the world is 18 inches from here to here. So I somehow want to just kind of not just teach us a theology. But to engage in the practice of a holy life. On this day that we call today, today, choose today whom you will serve, today, 2.5 billion pornographic emails sent out today, just today. And when you go to places in Eastern Europe and other parts of Europe, and I go to Africa and I go to Asia, it doesn't matter. You know, you go to Northridge, that's the capital of the porn industry in the United States. You go to Eastern Europe, it's the capital of the porn industry in Europe. Okay, there are all kinds of capitals. It, it really depends. There's just not a place that you can go in Europe where it's not a struggle. And I'm not going to talk about the addictions and all that stuff that we'll get to later. But the fact is, I'm concerned about this. And I think we've got to get to the root of the problem. I love the story of the guy who was visiting a church, and he goes to the church, and um, every Wednesday night, the chairman of the board would pray the same prayer. Lord, clean out the cobwebs. 
you know, the cobwebs are stuff that mucks up our lives throughout the days, the weeks, the months. Huh? Lord, clean out the cobwebs. And this young man was visiting, and he had just about enough of this. And the old man prayed, dear Lord, clean out the cobwebs. And the young man said, no, Lord, don't do it. Kill that spider. You know, get to the heart of the matter. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul, I think, would say. It's time for us to get to the heart of the matter. When, when, Paul called, when God called Paul to an apostolic ministry, he didn't just call us, him city to city to theologize. Uh, but to live the life that he was preaching and to teach how to live that life that he was preaching, to be imitators of him as he was of whom? Of Christ, right? And that's what today is all about. And, and I think one of those killing spiders passages is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I know you've got your outlines there, uh, but, uh, but I want you to hear this passage carefully, all right? I don't need to open my Bible because I've chosen to memorize it because I... I don't always have my Bible with me when I'm flipping through channels. I don't watch television on the road, but when I'm anywhere, and if I have a television or access to that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to verse 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, and that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Right? that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gave his Holy Spirit to you. In our little session together, I want to kind of unpack that passage. Well, okay, you can call it expose it or exposit it. That's fine, but I just simply want it to live. And he starts out, as you notice, with that little phrase, for this is the will of God. Now, he doesn't say this might be the will of God, this should be the will of God, this could be the will of God. What does he say? It is. You know, I've studied Greek and I've studied Hebrew, but it's not the big words in the Bible that bother me, it's the little ones like it is. What does is mean in the original Greek language? It means it is. It's God's will. It is the determinate will of God that what? That I be pure. Say it with me. It's God's will that I be pure. It's God's will that I be pure. See, I have more evidence that it's God's will that I be pure than it's God's will that I be here today. See, I don't have a choice. I do, but I don't in the eyes of God. I, I, I could have chosen not to come, but I don't get to choose not to be pure. It's God's will. I mean, that's so profound because it's not only God's will, but it's my wife's will. She's with me this time. Married 40 years have three daughters, uh, they're all married, I have eight grandchildren, and I've had 23 foster children. Let me tell you something, it's not only my wife's will, my children's will, my grandchildren's will, but it's also your will. Imagine me handing you a book on purity and then going out on the way home and shacking up. Can you imagine? It's not only God's will, and it's not only my family's will, but the body of Christ needs me to be pure as well, and so does the unbelieving world, doesn't it? Because remember what Nathan said to David when David fell. He said, you have given occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. They're laughing at us. And we keep hiding our heads in the sand. This, should, this room should be packed out. It's not packed out. I'm not opposed to studying church planning and other things. It's important. But I'll tell you what, you can plant 50 churches, and in five minutes of sexual indiscretion, you can wipe out your ministry. I think we better pay attention. Don't you think? And we better learn as shepherds how to shepherd people in this very important matter. It's not the only matter. We need to teach them theology. We need to teach them other things. You know, I, you know, you know I'm a pastor teacher. I spent, you know, we spent three years in the Gospel of John, didn't we, Mary? You know, we just spent a year in Colossians. I love verse-by-verse -verse exposition, but you cannot teach the whole counsel of God and not cover this matter of sexual purity. You're going to ignore, because God had more to say about sexual purity than he did about heaven or hell. How do I know that? Because I've added up the verses. You can do it and test me on it. And so here we are, for this is the will of God. Uh, and, and I, you know, just think about that. It's God's will, it's my family's will, my children's will, my children's children. I doubt if any of you here have great-grandchildren, but you know what? They need you to be pure too. 
And so I want you to notice now some commands, because when Paul goes on, he says, for this is the will of God, your set-apartness, your sanctification, uh, sanctification, your consecration, your holiness. You know, when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah 6, he said, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. Separate, separate, separate. There was no one, none like you. And I was created by the living God to walk in that same kind of holiness, not only coming up a partaker of the holiness of Christ. I can't do it in my own strength. So that's why Paul has the right to command us. Now, if you know anything about the Greek text as he moves on, you know these are not imperatives. But what they are, fascinating, is infinitives. But the infinitival structure of the verbs there are so powerful that the Greeks would know that they were punctiliar aristic. Do it and do it now. Uh, we base that on the Hebrew text where thou shalt not commit adultery is not in the imperative, it's in the indicative. It, the, the way you translate Exodus 20 is you don't commit adultery. You're a child of God. You, you're a follower of God. You don't commit adultery. Have you ever said that to your kids? You ever said, you know what? You're my child. You don't act that way. Well, that's what we have here. Paul's saying you're a child of God, bought by grace, bought with the blood of Christ. Before the foundation of the world, God called you to be his own, reached in the flock of man, called you to be his own, act like it. These are lifestyle commands. And the first one is to stop your immorality. Isn't that curious? Of all the things Paul could talk about. Now, he talks about love later on in chapter 4. Talks about leadership. Talks about lots of things. You know, the end times. But guess what? It comes right out the chute in chapter 4 in the pastoral section of the epistle. It says, I want you to abstain from sexual morality. To stop it and stop it now. When my kids were young, oops, you know I'm going to trip on this. Okay. When my kids were young, we used to play this game called red light, green light. You, you know that game. You know, you'd say green light and the kids go, and then, and then red light and they'd stop. Well, one day my daughter Deanna, my middle daughter, was about four years old running into the street and I saw this 12-ton truck coming about 50 miles an hour. I don't know what that is in kilometers, but this thing was speeding down the road. And there was nothing I could do. Everything went into slow motion. And I remember to this day shouting to her, Red light! She stopped right in the curb. And I didn't have the time to explain to her what happens when a 40-pound little girl meets a 12-ton truck. She was on a collision course with death, and she needed to respond to a simple lifestyle command. Stop it and stop it now. Red light. And that's exactly what Paul's saying. He says, I don't have the time. You can read the book, but I don't have the time now to explain all the consequences of moral impurity. The physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the social, the financial, you name them. If you play, you're going to pay. It's not my fault. I don't have the time. Just stop it. Whatever it is that we're doing, we just stop it. And I have to constantly say to myself when I'm traveling or in any other place, because I get as tempted as anybody does, stop it, stop it now, red light. Everybody say red light. Learn that. Red light, because that's what he's saying here. And there's lots of things. Secondly, lifestyle command number two, he says know how to acquire a mate. You see it there in verse four and five? That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And in essence, and I don't have a lot of time to exposit this, but He's talking about two ways to approach people. Man's way and God's. Is that a surprise? There are two ways to do anything in life. Why? Because there are two realities in life. There is a God and we're not him. And a holy God has every right to command creation. Creator says to creation, I want you to do it my way. Yeah, what's man, my way? My way, God says, is in sanctification and honor. Because when God puts a tape measure around a woman, he doesn't measure her body parts. I don't care what your favorite is. When God puts a tape measure around a woman, he doesn't measure her on the outside. In 1 Samuel 16, we're reminded that God looks on the inside. And ladies, when, when God measures a man, he doesn't measure his biceps. Or even his wallet. Or 
how he makes you feel. Or even his personality, because personality is what a man shows you, but character is what he is. God puts a tape measure around his heart. And we've got to start to look at people. One of the ways to deal with immorality in our hearts and our lives is to look at God's standard of how he looks at people in sanctification and honor. That's what he's looking for, and that's what we need to look for. And not just in the picking of a spouse, because I do believe that he's talking about that, the Greek word katastai there, uh, and, the, and the word skios and vessel there from 1 Peter chapter 3. You remember a guy by the name of Samson? That he man with that she weakness. Remember him? Remember he sees the Tishbite Philistine woman and he says to his parents, remember Manoah and we don't know his wife, her name. And he says to them, and the Hebrew text says this, go get her, she looks good to me. He didn't say, I'd sure like to have a Bible study with her. He said, go get her, she's looking good. And, he, and the parents do. And you know the rest of the story. Remember another guy by the name of King David? Standing in the cool of an evening. Sees a woman taking a bath and says to, his, says to his servants, go get her, she looks good to me. No, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, hmm, I, I'd sure like to write a psalm with her. You know, what does he say? Go get her. And they bring her to the bedroom, and you know the rest of the story, don't you? Imagine being those servants, uh, Mrs. Uriah, the king wants to see you in his bedroom. No, 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 don't, don't bother getting dressed. Why, why waste time? And history would have changed if David had remembered in that same cool of the evening what he wrote in another cool of the evening in the hills of Bethlehem when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Or Psalm 119, verses 9, 10, and 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? But by keeping it according to thy word and all thy ways they have sought thee. Don't let me wander from your commandments. Thy word have I what? hid or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But he'd forgotten that. And you know the rest of the story. And if you don't, you can read it. Learn how to look at people God's way in sanctification and honor. Third command, lifestyle command number three. Don't transgress and defraud your brother in the matter. Interesting. What's he saying here? Here's what he's saying. That when you're involved sexually with somebody other than your spouse, and we'll talk about God's design in the next session, you're violating God's design for you because he didn't design you for that. But you're also messing with the God who created her or him. And you're also messing with their future family and your future family. And the truth is you're messing with the people of God. I do a lot of pastors' conferences, and I remind pastors. I'll say to them, especially those guys that are in small churches, I'll say, you know, you want to be famous? Just fall. You want to be famous? Just have, a, just have an affair. And your name will spread all over the world. Your missionaries will do a really good job of telling your story and all the shame that goes with it. Maybe you better choose to be faithful, like a Jeremiah was called to preach till no one was listening. Just a thought. You mess with somebody else's. What a great reminder. One of the things I like to do with my the guys that dated my daughters is remind them that they're not, thy daughter is not theirs. She belongs to God and she belongs to her family and she belongs to me. That one of my Sons-in-law now was in love with my daughter Deanna, and uh, I'm a pistol shooter. It kind of runs in the family, and uh, so I train guys in pistol shooting when they want to get their concealed weapon permits or those kinds. It just happens to—I don't know why. It just happened to be pretty fair at it. So I was, and he asked me if I would just let him shoot, and I said, "Well, I don't. I don't want. Okay, fine. I'll take you out." So I took him out and. I was there on the firing line, and uh, he said, "I want to see you shoot." I said, "No, no, no. I'm not going to shoot." He said, oh, just one shot. I said, okay, one shot. So I had my 45 caliber pistol on my side, and uh, he was standing to this side, and I put it down 66 feet. And I'm looking at him, and I said, Kyle, let me just show you what instinctual, instinctual shooting can do. It just comes natural. And I looked at him, and I went, boom. It was the most perfect shot I have ever made. An angel took the bullet from the muzzle and took it down 66 feet and punched out a 
hole in the center of the target, punched it out just like a diamond. I pulled it up toward me, and inside I'm going, yeah! But on the outside, I looked at that man who was in love with my daughter. And I said, Kyle, as long as you stay six, six feet away from my daughter, you will be just fine. Because you're messing with somebody else's. That's exactly what God says. That's what we're talking about here. There was a young lady who came into my office many years ago, and she told her testimony. And in giving that testimony, she told me that she had been a porn queen and that she had just come to Christ three or four months ago and had given all that up. And then she began to cry. And we men, you know, when a woman cries, we don't know what to do. The mascara flowing, you know, she wasted all the tissue in my desk. I mean, it's just going over. No, I mean, it's just drenching my office. And I waited. I mean, an eternity, you know, three minutes. That's just an eternity for a man. And she, she's doing the sobbing. <laughs> And then she finally said, you don't understand. She said, I know that there are Christian men who are still looking at my naked body in films and in magazines. And don't they know I'm a child of God? And don't they know that I'm going to heaven? And don't they know that I'm not the sum total of my body parts? And don't they know that I'm not that person anymore? I'm a new creature in Christ. Why do they keep looking at me? And then she said this, and I'll never forget it. Can't you make them stop? You know my answer? Haven't been able to yet. Haven't been able to yet. But I'm going to keep trying. And I'm going to train as many pastors and church leaders around this globe so that we can look at a Norma someday in heaven. Someday in heaven. And say we gave it a pretty good shot. Let judgment begin with the household of God. But let judgment begin with the shepherds who need to teach the whole counsel of God and teach people how to live these lifestyle commands.